Oh, just a, just a minute. I did not push go live. <laughs> what? Oh, okay, wow. Wow. I'm so sorry. Oh my goodness. I am so sorry. We have been broadcasting you guys and I forgot to push go live. <laughs> okay, because Tammy keeps texting me. Oh. Okay. Hold on, yeah, I'm too. Hold on, one I am so, so sorry. So welcome to the program tonight. Oh my goodness. I am so sorry. So for eight minutes, we've been talking since we had an audience and we did Oh my good, I get to start over. <laughs> so we are so sorry, but we are here tonight, and we did start at six o'clock. I just forgot to put um to put go live, so I apologize again. I'm Glenda Wolfolk uh, of No Sister Left Behind. I am the uh, CEO and the president, and I'm so excited to be here tonight. We have an excellent, excellent topic tonight, and I'm going to introduce our our, our Pam Walker is going to introduce herself. Or Linda Factory. I'm sorry, I'm just too excited. We've been already did. <laughs> <laughs> well, ahead, again, my name is Linda Factory and I'm the financial treasurer of No Sister Left Behind and so glad that you all uh, have taken the time to join us tonight and we've got some great uh, topics to cover and some uh, two great women to share with us tonight. Yeah. So enjoy. Yes. yes, we do. And uh, good evening. My name is Pam Walker and I'm the vice president of No Sister Left Behind. Um, I'm also the chairperson of the membership drive. The membership drive. Yeah. <laughs> if you haven't already, uh, please visit our website at no sister left behind the number two dot org and join. Now, as Linda will say, and she'll probably say it again, you do not have to be a <laughs> you do not well, have to be a well, member. Yes in order to uh, uh, involve yourself in the activities and seminars that we have. But we would love for you to become a member. Uh, we are a nonprofit and all money go to support um, our programming. Mm -hmm. um, and this month is our membership drive month. Yeah, 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 so we yeah. have one more day. However, you can join at any time. And if you so desire, uh, you can also uh, just donate. Five dollars, ten dollars, whatever. We welcome that as well. We do, we do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Pam. Thank you so much. So at this time, we're gonna go right into our program again, ladies. I apologize because we were on and I forgot to push the live. <laughs> so we're just talking. So here we go. So Terika, again, can you introduce yourself and tell us what you do? Yes. Um, hi everyone. Uh, thank you, No Sister Left Behind, for having me here today. Uh, my name is Terrica Wolfalk. I am a, um, a born and raised in Bakersfield, went to Bakersfield High School. Um, <laughs> I, um, I've been a probation officer here in LA County for the last 15 years. I've worked in the child trafficking unit for the last nine years. Um, it was a brand new pilot project back in uh, 2011. And um, we'll talk more about that. But um, I was the first PO actually in that um, in that unit, and I've still been here. And it's been about nine years again. So um, I have a master's degree in public administration, and I'm currently working on my comprehensive exam for my master's degree in marriage and family therapy. And so that's what I'm doing right now. Um, I've gone from holding a caseload um, early on in 2011 to now becoming the court liaison. And what I do as the court liaison, I work. We have a specialized court here in Compton, and um, uh, we work with the girls who have been trafficked or are at high risk for trafficking. And I do consulting, and I hold weekly, I lead weekly MBTs. And so that's what I'm doing right now, um, as well as providing therapy to girls at a treatment center. Um, that have been fat. so that's what I'm doing right now. That's good. All right. Yeah. All right, Miss Ori, it's on you. <laughs> hey everybody, thank you again, everyone, for having me on this show. Um, it's really an honor, I think, also because of the connection and relationship that has been built between me and Miss Wolfolk, as along with um, my daughter and Miss Wolfolk, um, and from how far we've come from and how we met. So it's really an honor to be on here today. Um, unfortunately, right now, I wouldn't say unfortunately, um, it's actually a blessing right now. I'm not really working for any organization. I am a board member of an organization by the name of Survivor the Leader and doing work there. Um, but I had the privilege of working for multiple organizations that work um, as first responders 
um, with victims of sex trafficking, um, as well in Orange County in LA. I had recently left, probably about almost a year ago now, for an agency called Save Innocence, which is based in LA. And it was a very beautiful experience being able to work for an organization that, you know, was around when it was just, I knew it was around to give a one man show when the founder had um, started it. And being able to be a part of that organization, you know, and the growth of it. And, and the most, I think, impactful thing for me was just being able to go into those same places I once was at. So Juvenile Hall, you know, going back to the group, mm-hmm. college, especially where I met Miss Warfolk at, and being able to serve kids and youth um, in those populations and be able to, you know, be the voice that I have growing up as well as like being that advocate that a lot of us didn't have. Like Miss Wolfolk mentioned and we'll talk about later, it wasn't that many programs going on at that time. Um, wow. It was a lot differently. And I've also had the honor of being able to serve on different um, committees and boards in the state of California and train across the nation to different organizations or different schools or also as well as hospitals and different um, federal and invest- like bureau places. So, yeah. <laughs> That's good. You know a whole lot. You know a whole lot. But right now, ladies, we're going to move on into our questions for our guests tonight. And we're going to ask that. Um, when they finish their questions, we're going to have a answer, question and answer period afterwards so you can ask questions because they're going to give us a whole lot of information and we definitely need to know as a community. Okay, the first question, Ms. Pam, is on you. Yes, again, <laughs> welcome, Ms. Ori, and welcome, Ms. Wolfolk. And this is Glenda's baby, in case y'all didn't know. Glenda's <laughs> <laughs> baby. <laughs> okay, yes, the first question tonight is, how did your relationship evolve? You want me to go? You want to go? Um, so back in, like I said, back in 2011, when I started, um, they sent me to, the county sent me to all these trainings uh, regarding sex trafficking. And so I went to Boston. I did all this, Boston, uh, New York, um, Sacramento. So I did all these different trainings. Uh, to prepare me for working with uh, victims of sex trafficking. And so um, Ori was my first uh, client. And so that was back in 2011 and she was my first. And um, she has, uh, there was no, and and not just Ori, it was Ori and one other girl. Um, But all that training that I took went out the door. I mean, it was a good foundation, but there was nothing like working with kids one-on-one and really having that that on-the-ground experience. And so they have taught me all that I know about working with youth in the foster system and um, and being that support. But I'll let Ori, she may have a different story. <laughs> so, you know, it's funny is because I think it's really important. And I feel like I can say it because of the situation. But when I got on Miss Wolfo's caseload, at one point I was transferred because I was like, you know, my, my former PO felt like there was nothing that she could do for me. And I think that's really important for people to know, especially working in the service field, is that when Miss Wolfo got my case, there was a note on the case that said, good luck, you know, like, um, and I had some problems with the, the, the fire PO, and it, it's nothing about that, but I was just a, it shows you just the lack of not as a person, but as a system, we were way far back on how to um, work with you, especially that came from traumatic experience. That I did, you know, I had never been disrespectful or intended to be disrespectful towards anyone else. It was just a defense mechanism as well as, um, you know, that's the way that you've been taught to survive. So when I met Ms. Wilson, I can remember my first interaction, I was being introduced in juvenile hall before I was transferred to placement. Um, and I don't know if she remembered this, but when we met, we were in this little room and she had to come and do my, my, my paperwork, you know, I was being transferred over and I was kind of stuck at the time, like just being stuck in juvenile home. And I'll never forget our interaction was so authentic and so real. You know, mm-hmm. you know, you coming in, you got the new you know, like, yeah, I'm gonna try to show her who got that, you know, just thinking you're gonna be a certain <laughs> way. And she came in there and was so she had a prejudice that I don't, you have to automatically respect because it's so genuine. And I knew that she was there for the right reason. So, well, mm-hmm. you know, you don't want to do this paperwork, but then I know I'm going to use to be sitting here. Like, well, so which one? <laughs> and it was just sometimes it's not about like, you know, feeling like a child, you're here and a child is there, like working with youth, and especially in the system, mm-hmm. but meeting them where they're at. And it's what I've always done that. So then when I moved to the group home and I was placed there, 
I can definitely say like the way our interactions was just, it didn't matter of the training that she had prior to that. Because both of respected me as a youth. Not even as respect, but would have treated me and treated me like her own child. So that was teaching me about responsibility. That was teaching me about accountability, teaching me how to communicate better in different ways. And sometimes it's not the stuff that we learn in books, but just how would we raise our own children? How are we raising our own children? What are the values that we're setting in place and the things that we need to be teaching them? Because she could teach me stuff that, you know, what the people could be telling her in trainings and stuff. But when I leave this group home or when I leave the foster care system at 18 years old, the world's not going to care that I'm a C-sex victim. Yeah. We hope that people will be thinking about me. When you get that first apartment and when you get that job, because I can remember plenty of times when Ms. Wilco would say, you can't talk to your boss like that. When you upset about yeah. something, you can't, you can't behave in that way. And it's just all those different things. So we, I would say um, we definitely had a unique relationship um, and connection because it was always authentic. It was always genuine on her part. It was always that way. So you couldn't help but give respect and, and be that way back, you know? So um, yeah. there's nothing bad about it. Um, <laughs> that's good. And she's still in my life now. And she's actually <laughs> Evelyn's godmother, so she's stuck with us now. That's good, Ori. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, dear. The next question is, what is the commercial sexual exploitation of children? So um, the commercial sexual exploitation of children, in a nutshell, um, when we're talking about human trafficking and child sex trafficking, um, it is, in simple terms, it is the exchange of sex for money. Um, sexual exploitation, um, when I go and interview girls, maybe they don't have a trafficker or a, or a pimp, but sexual exploitation still refers to um, a kid needing their basic needs met and some, some person is providing them their basic needs, whether that's um, food, shelter, clothing, in exchange for sex. So wow. even if a kid does not, is not being trafficked on the street and does not have a pimp, they can still be sexually exploited. So there's sexually exploited youth and then there's the commercial sexual exploitation. Commercial is that, again, is that exchange for money. Wow. Okay, the second part of that question is, is what is a child prostitute? There's no such thing. Okay. So, so <laughs> there's no such, and that, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. Hmm. Um, there's no such thing as a child prostitute. Um, hmm. Children under the age of 18 cannot consent to sex. Right. So you cannot be called a, a prostitute if you're not um, the age of 18. Mm -hmm. And um, and Ori can, can back me up with that. Um, what do you think of when you think of prostitute? So when you think of prostitute, you attach dirty, you attach whore, you attach all these different things. Mm -hmm. We're talking Criminal. about somebody's child. Criminal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're talking about a 12 year old. We're talking about a 13 year old. Yeah. So no, there's no such thing. Uh, so when we see these terms and we see this language regarding surrounding uh, prostitution and we attach a child to that, there's no such thing as a child being a prostitute or a sex worker and whatever else uh, you want to call that. But there's no such thing. So that was a trick question, but I wanted to show uh, when we see mm -hmm. prostitution in the news and we see um, people talk about kids like that, there's no such thing as that. And when you attach prostitute, again, you're attaching um, that a child is, is dirty or they intend to do something. Yeah. And you can't be a, a prostitute and, and wanting sex like that at, at that age and someone's older than them. And Ori, I don't know if you wanted to chime in with that. Well, yeah, because I think that people need to understand, especially in the culture that I grew up in, in the background, you know, growing and raised born and raised in a church and being a part of a community was, you know, we put these labels and use this language already on younger kids at such a young age. You know, we call them fast. We tell them we don't want them to be fast or we don't want them to be in the streets or, oh, she's choosing to be out there. And I could never, ever think about one time that I ever told my mother or my mother ever would have thought that, you know, at you have the school day thing, right? You have the career day that comes to school. There's never been a booth that said prostitution, that a child would want to sign up for that. A child wow. doesn't expect that or want that. And we have to, like, at one point, too, redefine choice when, we, when we're talking about choice. But to, like, piggyback off of what Ms. Wilfolk was saying, I can remember at times when um, I was first, like, entered the system. I wasn't picked up for child prostitution, but there were other charges that led me into the system. 
but there were many other youth that were in there for prostitution for a crime that like there's no possible way especially um people don't understand the impact back then on a child will be charged with prostitution and then the trafficker was only looking at six months in jail. Wow. And the person purchasing the would slap on the wrist and get a ticket and that was it. Um, children were being criminalized um, back to back. And I think that's what people need to understand is it is definitely about changing the language. I've had to correct people in mean, different community parts of like, no, it's not prostitution. You know, it's someone being exploited. This kid is a victim. You know, she's not mm-hmm. even legal to consent to sex, so how can she be charged with something in that way? Yeah, so I think it's and we need to call it what it is. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't even know you were still talking. No, 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 no. But we need to call it what it is. Is uh, is they're a victim. They're a victim yeah. of trafficking. So when you change those, when you change that language, it's a whole different ball game. You yeah. talk about they're a victim of child abuse. They're a victim of of trafficking. They are not a prostitute. Mm-hmm. That, That's makes nice. right. that makes sense. That's good. Well, I have a a question. Um, that a lot of people are wondering, a lot of parents, guardians, and that is what makes a child vulnerable to being trafficked? Trafficked. Trafficked. Um, I can say, I'll say just from my, because of my experience, I want people to know that even though they're part of my broken home, I grew up in still a foundation and a family that was very stable. And I grew up in a family that was very family oriented, family vacations, you know, family, um, um, you know, reunions and family traditions. I grew up in the church, sang in the choir. I played sports. My mom kept me in any activity. And I said, the number one thing that made me vulnerable was the lack of communication between me and my mother. Someone else teaching me about the things that the world had already prepared and what was going to happen when the street lights go off instead of my own parents. And I think because I grew up in a home that was so sheltered, when I say shelter, I'm not speaking because of the church. I'm speaking of being afraid of talking to my child about something because I think that I'm going to expose her to something. It only can be sheltered and not being prepared of what might come in front of me growing up in an environment that was not safe. Even though I had the best mom and even though we had rocky things and stuff happened in my home, I grew up in a dangerous area. I grew up in the ghetto, you know, so there was things that I needed to be talked about that I need to have conversations with my mother or with someone in the family to know that when I was catching a bus by myself and coming home, knowing what I could be up against. And it's those uncomfortable conversations that we need to have with children. I didn't have a stamp on my forehead that read that I was going to be vulnerable one, one day. It was something that was progressively and that was persistent. So it was a lot of communication. It's not being aware of surroundings. You know, it's uh-huh. not having a safety person to talk to. But it's also, I had been abused before. I had been molested. So some things that was taking place in the home. And I just want to say this. I came from, uh, I'm, I'm going to say a time period where you didn't talk to people outside of our home about what was going on in the home. You better not go tell Susie and Rosie and who else mm-hmm. what might have happened to you in the home or what's going on with the family. You know, you had to keep family business, family business. And I think for me, it taught me that I couldn't trust in any type of adult, whether that was a counselor, whether that was a teacher or somebody that could be trusted. And it was mm-hmm. all these things that was implanted in me that was taught to me very young that set me up, honestly, for failure. And I'll tell you, it's like meeting the, meeting the kid and not understanding that, you know, when you're talking about sex or when you're talking about drugs, these are conversations you should be having with your parents, not being um, aware of what type of people are out there. Knowing that there are mm-hmm. good and bad people, but the details, a lot of times us as parents leave out. We leave out the details of things because we don't want to expose our child. And I think mm-hmm. a, a big of what we have seen in Ms. Wolfolk will speak about it, but um, especially the populations that we've worked with, a lot of them do come from the foster system and from the child welfare mm-hmm. system. Unfortunately, they do, or they've had some type of encounter with it. So I might not have been a foster in foster care by having not a family, but I had a family and I was already in the juvenile justice system. So there's definitely um, correlation that draws um, into that and making a youth vulnerable, you know, whether that's abuse, whether it's, and I want to say this for parents as well that might be watching today. Your child can be raised in the most stable home, very stable home, great foundation environment. But it's at some point your child has to make a choice and will be faced with choices and decisions. 
Mm-hmm. So fortunately and unfortunately, Evan, Evelyn, my child, will have a lot much more awareness than I did as a child because of the experiences I went through. Right? But that does not mean that it makes her less susceptible to it. Meaning Evelyn can go to college, God forbid, and something can happen because whatever her experience, her journey is like. So sometimes yeah. people want to label kids like, well, because she grew up in the poor and because she was abused and she was raped or she had childhood trauma. My kid, that won't happen to my kid. But guess what? The internet is the fastest growing crime right now. Trafficking is the number one fastest growing crime because of the internet. I have nieces yeah. and I have little cousins who are on TikTok, who talk to random strangers, who talk to kids who they think is in a whole other state. And guess what? At the end of the day, they don't know if that's really a kid or not. So it's all, yeah. the, it's like, at once we were up against the street, you know, we were up against personal, like, no one was hanging around. Now we're up against the internet. We don't know who's yeah. who nowadays. So I think that's a really important thing for parents to know, that just because you may you think in that we have a stable foundation on our kids, um, technology, man, is putting our kids at risk already. Wow. Yeah. And, like, and I wanted to, uh, to piggyback on that. So um, just to be clear, so... So with foster care, yes, foster care is a vulnerability. Um, poverty is a vulnerability. But um, like Ori said, low self-esteem or just esteem in general is a vulnerability. So um, you can grow up in a two-parent. I've had to walk out of the courtroom many times after talking to a child, asking her, can I tell her parents? Because her parents had no idea that she was being trafficked. Wow. Um, trafficking doesn't just happen at night. It can happen during the school day. It can happen her ditching school and coming home and being there for dinner at 6 p.m. So, um, you know, kids can come from a two-parent household. Anybody and any woman on this this line or anyone that wants to be told they're pretty is vulnerable for trafficking. Anytime yeah. men do that, so it, our traffickers do that. So anybody that has low self-esteem or, like I said, not even just low self-esteem, you just want to be told you're pretty, or you just want to be told that you're um, you're beautiful, or you can be a certain thing. Every child is um, is can be vulnerable for trafficking. Wow! My goodness. Okay, so the next question. I think I'm here. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> what types of pimps and traffickers are there? What types of pimps and traffickers are there? So. Um, I want to, you know, I I use the word uh, pimp because that is usually what um, culturally and in some communities call it, but a pimp is a trafficker. Um, It falls under the line of trafficker, but um, just for purposes of of pimp. So in the community, um, we thought we we refer to three types of of pimps. That's the CEO pimp. That is the one that may, um, you know, get you offline or you see him in the mall and he tells you that he is uh, a CEO of a record company or he's uh, an agent, whatever the case may be, uh, that is where you would get, uh, that's the CEO pimp. That's how they reel you in. Uh, Then there's the Romeo pimp. The Romeo pimp is, or boyfriend pimp. That is the one that will tell you, again, you're beautiful. um, They have the nice car. They come alongside of you as a boyfriend. Then there's a gorilla pimp. The gorilla pimp is the one that um, will kidnap you and just snatch you off the street. So those are the three types of pimps. Mm. Um, or did you want to add something to that? Yeah, I want people to know because today the times that we're living in too, it, um, pimp doesn't just have to be a male. It has to be female, which they call a matter. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. A woman um, that can traffic kids. And that sometimes is different. And I want people to know that there are different tactics to the way that the pimps are because of who they prey on. So a child that may come from a stable home and I need to be wine and dine with gifts and told right. that they can buy a car and have a nice home. But someone who's broken in the inside and might need to be told that they're loved and that they're cared for it might need that. Yeah. Some might um, have to use force and violence because the child not want for nothing else. And that's the way that they inflict right. fear. You know, and I think a lot of times too, people need to also understand gangs are getting involved with these young kids because the girls are being told, or the are being told that when yeah. they be from this gang, they have to do this, or they be a part of a gang, and then maybe their big homie or someone that they're that that's above them is telling them now they have to work for the gang and make money. I mean, mm-hmm. I've seen it in yeah. all different ways, especially young boys being trafficked like that through gangs. Um, so I think people have to keep in mind it's all based on your environment. Also, know that choppers are pimps on. 
primarily, you know, I want to say it, not just black men. You go to Utah, you go to Idaho, you probably won't find yeah. a black trafficker. So I keep that in mind because of the environments are different. In Irvine, where, you know, where I live in Orange County, you might not find a black trafficker. You might find someone that may be predominantly Hispanic or Caucasian or, or Asian or Asian or Pacific Islander that are running black. Yeah. So it's completely different in the setting that you're in. But if you're in LA, you're in San Bernardino County, mm -hmm. you have to keep in mind the populations and the group of people that you know that you're surrounded with. And there's no type of look. I've done presentations with many, many students in classes. And it's funny to see how you can ask a child, what do you think a pimp looks like? And majority mm -hmm. of the classes say, he doesn't have no flashy clothes, the grill, he got chains yeah. on, he probably has a, he has a nice car. And then you have that very few that he can look like anybody. Anybody that wants to take advantage of you. And people need to understand that. You know, and, it, and it's definitely, you have to be very careful with profiling or, you know, and thinking of yeah. that kind of stuff. Because yeah. not all, you know, black men are traffickers and not all Hispanics are traffickers just because they might have tattoos or they might have a gold chain. You know, and I think it's, it's absolutely being sure of being reminded of that too as well. So that's good, or yeah. 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 yeah, that's good. And and that that um that is the common misconception. I know that's probably uh we'll talk about it uh later, but that traffickers look a certain way. And no, traffickers are in the mall. They are driving past your child's school, um, driving past their child's middle school recruiting. Um, so, you know, that misconception about what a trafficker looks like is what gets people every time. Ooh. So that's what makes um, our kids so susceptible and vulnerable to being trafficked is the look and assuming that there's a certain look or assuming that they look a certain way or whatever. So mm -hmm. that's just and something then, to keep in mind. And as well, so we got to let them know about just like how the most common one we probably see is just the boyfriend. It's the boyfriend. The boyfriend, the boyfriend. absolutely. Well, you know, not even just the it's the boyfriend. Starting off in a relationship and then it gets deeper and deeper and yeah. hey, we need some money or we want to leave here. You can't stand being at home. Well, let's let's go out of town. Let's leave here. I'm gonna take care of you. You take care of me. And it says these things. And I know it sounds so crazy. And I want people to understand this. When we think about when I think about even raising Evelyn, you know, as these years are gonna go by, <laughs> and I can say I love my child as much as I could. How do I not give her enough love? And there's always kids are never running. They're never running to something. They're always running from something, right? Mm -hmm. And it's always something that maybe we could have given them differently. And I'll tell you this. When I look at many women that I've come across in my life, especially men, we've all might have been in a situation where we didn't make the best choice. Absolutely. How do we expect a child to get yeah. out of something? If I know, personally knew, grown women who dealt with something that wasn't healthy, an unhealthy relationship, or I'm, mm -hmm. a, I'm not gonna quote this person, but I'll never forget we were in training, right? And um, mm -hmm. they said, women would say, well, I don't know why kids, you know, women and men, I don't know why kids would just do that, why like they would deal with somebody that treats them that way. That is just horrible, right? Well, and this person said, well, I don't know why a, a woman, a grown woman who has degrees and has an amazing background will let mm -hmm. her man drop her off at work and him go up and lay up and not do anything. And she's out here working and while he's driving her car and while she's paying on the bill. So I don't understand why she would be there. So I really have to right. keep in mind um, that sometimes we put these perceptions or we think, well, why would they do this? Or why wouldn't they just leave? Why would they allow this man to say that he loves her but he beat her? Well, why do a lot of us have captive situations? Why do we stay in marriages? Why do we stay in unhealthy relationships? Why do we go back and forth and not yeah. have boundaries with people? You know, so yeah. I keep, if I'm not doing it at 25 and she's not doing it at 30 and she's not doing it at 32, why should we expect a child to know any different? Absolutely. Way? That's good. So I think it's important. That is good. That's good. Okay. <laughs> no, that, that, that's good. And, and just to, um, you know, when I talk about those three types of pimps, like we said, uh, CEO, Romeo slash boyfriend, and uh, gorilla pimp. At any time, a trafficker can be all three. So wow. he could start off as a Romeo pimp. And then um, once he, the girl says that she wants to leave and she no longer wants to be there, now he's keeping her um, against her will. Mm -hmm. So so now that he can become a gorilla pimp. So just because he starts off as one, he can always become all three. So I wow. just wanted to, to clarify that. 
Yeah. All right. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, you, you guys have somewhat hit on my next question. Um, but, um, you know, a, another point um, is that it's, the victim is not always a female. There are males as well. There oh, yeah. are trafficking uh, out there. So um, just because you have a son, don't think, oh, well, it's all right. It's all right. The same things apply to them as well. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, so my next question is, um, what, is the, what are some of the common myths and misconceptions when it comes to human trafficking? I'll, I'll say one. Um, I think that sometimes, you know, the way that it's out there about trafficking is that girls are getting kidnapped off the street and that is the only way. Like, you know, and so we, we push on that one, then it, it's actually the opposite. Most girls are swooned by a boyfriend slash Romeo pen. Wow. Out of all my years, I think um, I was in my unit for five years. I can probably count maybe one girl actually being kidnapped or held against her will. Mm-hmm. All of my other girls, it's always been a boyfriend type of situation. Someone um, who is capitalizing off of her vulnerabilities, her her low self-esteem, her being in the foster care system, um, knowing that uh, no one wants them, those types of vulnerabilities. And when we talk about, before I forget, because I don't think I wrote it on my list, but um, as a vulnerability, uh, being in the foster care system, you know, we all often get, um, what is that called when you get a, 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 a notification on your phone when somebody's kidnapped? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What is that called? Amber, 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 Amber Alert. Alert. <laughs> you tell me how many kids go missing from the foster care system every single day. And you tell me if your Amber Alert notification is coming up on your phone. Mm-hmm. Likely not. Mm-mm. And kids are going missing every single day. That is a huge vulnerability. These traffickers know that. So again, they're um, they're giving them what they need: shelter. You know, kids run from group homes for a variety of reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, there could be abuse. They could. They may not feel safe. It's a variety of reasons. But um, kidnapping is is not a. It's not that it does not happen. But I would say that to say that. Kids are only getting kidnapped is not the truth. Your girls, our girls are being swooned by someone that's a boyfriend pimp. It could be another female, but it's often in a um, in a nice, sweet, subtle, swooning type of way. Mm, my goodness. And or if you want to be more. Yeah, I think another misconception and number one is that people believe that it's a choice. And I really want people to know that at 11 years old, when I was out there, 11 and 12, I didn't choose to be out there. It's not a choice. I didn't ask for that. It's not something that I wanted to do or be in my life. Um, and if you want to do, if you want to really, because people believe it. I can't tell you how many people, even church folks sometimes, run into them like, well, they want to be out there. They want to be out there. They seem like they want to do it. And I think the misconception is just that sometimes our perspective needs to change on the way that we knew things or the way that we might, something that might have been generational. I think another misconception is that people think that even if they don't have a trafficker, well, that might, they're choosing to be out there. But exploitation looks different. Anytime somebody is purchasing a child or in there is an exchange that is happening, it's exploitation. Uh-huh. I, I have not met one, even young girls who end up in clubs and here in the dancing, that want to be in there, that are being still trafficked by the bouncers, that are being trafficked by the managers, and are being trafficked by even some of the artists that come up there and buy these kids, and that and trade money for sex in those mm-hmm. ways. So I want people to understand that it's not a choice. Um, another misconception, people believe that, oh, it can't happen to my kids. They also think that it's not happening right here. Right now, where I'm at in Dana Point, right? I'm in Dana Point right now. If I was to go onto the internet and to check and just to see on one of those websites, and I typed in um, places where children and young adults are being sold or they're being exploited on, I can guarantee you no one from LA is driving to Dana Point to buy. No one from Dana Point is driving to LA to purchase sex. It's happening right in your community. Wow. You know, and that's the kind of misconception that people think, well, no, yeah. in my community, that doesn't happen here. That that's not happening next door. And then there's a sting operation mm-hmm. and the house gets shut down. Yeah. Um, I think another misconception is that people um think that a lot of times the girls are on drugs. Sometimes they are, but not all the time. The drugs 
or the addiction comes a part of being in the life and being in the business, being in the chaos. It's not really something, they're not always out there just strung out on drugs. And for me personally, working with you who then become addicted, um, it is very important for now to know that that is something now that we have to deal with the monkey on their back before we deal with the, the trafficking stuff. Now. You know, yeah. and it's a whole nother ball game. So I think people need to understand that. Um, also, is that trafficking will be different for each and every child. Mm -hmm. um, especially because there's so much even because race has something to do with trafficking, you know? Um, and the way that black and brown girls are treated out there compared to other youth. It looks mm -hmm. a lot different. Um, and they're yeah, um, I don't know too much into that, but they're definitely um mm -hmm. being targeted much more, especially in certain communities. So yeah. My goodness. Okay, ladies, I think it's is it break time, Linda? Yes, yes. Okay, ladies, we're gonna take up. Before we break, this is such an important subject tonight. I, I, I'm going to urge everyone who is looking now, if you would share this program. If you would just press share on your um, um, Facebook Live, press share. Because this is information that we need as parents, that we need as members of this community. Mm -hmm. That's good, Pam. That's good. That's good. Okay, ladies, we're going to take a five-minute break. Don't leave for long. Come back for the second half of this candid <laughs> conversation with Ori Freeman and Terrica Wolfo. Yes. That's All right. right. <laughs> we'll be back. Five minutes. Five minutes. We're going to give them a minute. <laughs> You're doing great, Ori. Ah, excellent. Are we still live? Yeah. Yeah, we're still live. It's still going. Oh, okay. Get up and go get something to drink or anything you want to do. So okay. I gotta tell y'all about my retreat. I'm on my retreat. Even people can listen in to this. I'm on my I'm on my God retreat right now. But this woman on here, Miss Wolf, she gone right now, but she is just so amazing. She don't even know the work that God is doing within her life and through me. She ran oh. away because she knows. <laughs> <laughs> oh sweet. There she is. <laughs> what y'all say about me? I was, talking, I was talking about how amazing you are and just the work that God is doing through you. And that uh, people just really under, need to understand. And she's not going to say it, but at some point, you know, me and this little folk is getting ready to launch a training soon about the power That's good. of awesome. the awesome. Awesome. And Very good. Very it's good. Only God yeah. gives. <laughs> That's it. She really does. That is great. I think you guys will do great things because of it. I really do. A lot of people will be pulled out. I just. It's numbers untold that you'll be able to do because you come from two different platforms and you've met yeah. to, to uh, make it a better world. So I, I think it's going to be excellent. Yeah. Congratulations to both of you. I'll be praying for you. Thank you. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. Awesome. We're just glad y'all came on tonight, too. <laughs> yes, I love it. The information is so, so helpful. A lot of things I've already learned that you know, the difference between the pimps and yeah. all of that, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> the CEO pimp in there. The, the I, I think it's important to talk about those because I think yeah. um, I think folks have a, a, it's just that misconception of what they think a pimp is versus what a pimp really is. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's girls that get trafficked in college. Wow. You know, they think that they're going to do some model. They want to be a video vixen. You know, we can go on and on. Um, these trainings can be, you know, an eight hour day. So wow. we're trying to give you guys tidbits. But um, there is a lot. And there's a lot of testimony from girls like women, like I said, uh, that have gone off to college mm -hmm. and, um, and have been trafficked in college. So. Right. My goodness. Wow. But you know what? We, we talked we talk about um, misconceptions. And, and this is just my opinion, you know, you can tell me if I'm wrong or right, but it doesn't, it's not always a stranger. Now, I know you said boyfriend, uh, but what about family members, that uncle, you know, um, that dad or... Uh, oh, yeah. No comment is, okay. That, that happens. So, um, you, the you know, and, and, and what I said, we're trying to give tidbits, but, you know... Yeah, it, it can be um, an uncle. It can be um, someone that, uh, anyone that benefits. I've, I've had some uh, kids on my caseload where their uh, 
their mother was on drugs, unfortunately, and she was selling her child to the um, the drug dealer. Yeah, and well. so you have those situations. You do have some some family members. I don't see it um, all the way often, but you do have that. I've had that come across yeah. my my desk several times. So you will yeah. have that, um, and you have you have family members. Since we're talking about family members. That again benefit. So you have a grandmother or you have an aunt that knows their son, knows their nephew is trafficking, um, wow. trafficking folks, but they benefit. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about benefiting, you know, they know their their son or their, like I said, their nephew or whoever is um selling girls for a living. Wow. But if the bills are being paid and we get to remain in our house and I still get to drive my Mercedes, we'll be hush hush. Mm -hmm. The community has to get involved because we know mm -hmm. we all know somebody who has a drug problem, you know, and they have oh, children, yeah. you know, so we need to be a little bit more vigilant. Yeah. Because like, right. you know, like you said, it's not only the stranger coming into the household oh, or coming into your life. It's people right there. Right there in the house. I think, yeah. I think yeah. the people in the family, the parents sometimes, so... Mm -hmm. Yeah. People need, yeah. People need to also understand that. Um, I, I know that this is kind of it's not a it's a different topic for another time, but the grooming starts very very young. Yes, and I'll, and I'll tell you why. It very matters. It matters of how you raise your children and teach them. So for my daughter, she's only two. Um, but my daughter <laughs> is if she comes into someone's home and she speaks, she says hello. But my does, daughter does not have to hug you because you want her to hug her. And it's starting those boundaries off very early. You yeah. know, not, people yeah. don't bathe her. People just don't change her diaper. She doesn't have to sit yeah. on your lap. And she mm -hmm. won't sit on your lap. You know, and it's those things. Yeah. I feel like I come from a generation, in not my generation, my mother's generation, um, that came along, you know, and we come from a family of like, hush, hush, like how we mentioned someone like, you know, don't say, someone mentioned in the chat, like, don't say anything. And then too many times I've ran across kids and have, have been impacted by the stories that I hear that the mother knew her child was being molested. She knew, mm -hmm. I, I yeah. couldn't, I know my daughter, I know Evelyn. So I know as a mother, you can't tell me that you were oblivious or that you did not think that that was going on. Or the man yeah. that you were dating were not touching your children. Or the uncle, you didn't have a funny feeling about that. Especially being women of God or, yeah. you know, following the spirit. So I think we, we have to grow out of that caring about what sometimes, um, and I think I've had to catch myself sometimes in ways of not wanting to be mean, but I, I was given a duty and a responsibility by God to protect my child. So if That's she's right. not comfortable right. with something, I'm not going to be comfortable with it. And if I pick up something that she might not pick up, I'm going to let that be known. I'm going to let it be heard in still a respectful way, but don't come near my child. Yeah. You know, right. and I think that, especially in the community, it's, it goes unheard. So many women and, and men come out about being molested and being sexually assaulted, and the mother and the parents never knew nothing about it, or a family knew about it, and, you know, and not anyone else knew. They never got any, they never was able to talk to anybody. Mm -hmm. And it's really important because a lot of that stuff stems, we know where it stems from. We we know I mean, what happens when a foundation is not strong. It builds yeah. insecurity. It builds a lack of stability. You know, there's no strong foundation. When there's no strong foundation, then the human becomes just you know the person becomes yeah very very vulnerable to to being broken in whatever way. Yeah. I see it too many times, and, and as we spoke earlier, I have survivor sisters who actually have been trafficked by their family members. Mm -hmm. You know, or it being generational. You know, God, my mother, my mom is actually on this call, but my mother was trafficked at a very young age. And I can only imagine what life would have been like for the both of us if I was around my mom when she was being exploited, you know, in that way. Or whatever, whatever she was going through, the things that, you know, her testimony in her life and what that would have yeah. been like. It only would have been generational. And yeah. she always saying, we, we have conversations, she's on right now, but... I used to say, Mama, I'm glad that, you know, God at a point in time were separated, you know, for so many years because I would have been right out there with you. I would have been like, I'm not leaving my mom. Like, I'm not leaving you. So a lot of things sometimes trafficking is generational, you know? Yeah. Um, and yeah. Also, Absolutely. Yeah. Because okay, ladies. If I can interrupt right uh, real quick before we go back on this, it's time for us to go back on. But there's a lot of background noise. So if you're not speaking, if you can sort of mute yourself. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, got it. All right, so we need to, to uh, ready to go forward. <laughs> okay, ladies, we're back. We're gonna get started on our next questions and we've been talking all through the break and it's been good and some of you have been on and listening. So we're gonna start with our next question. Um, why don't you, okay, I, I don't know how to say this one. Why don't you, why don't they just leave? Why don't they just walk off from that trafficker? Why, why, why don't they just leave? It seems easy enough. Some people may think. Um, I'll, I'll start. Um, okay. There's a term called trauma bonding. And uh, trauma, trauma bonding in a simple term is just a psychological response to, um, to abuse or to your abuser and being attached to that abuser. And um, it just develops over time and it's an unhealthy bond with a trafficker. So, um, you know, for example, and we talked earlier about the boyfriend pimp. So uh, that person has now bonded with that person. They bonded with the, the trafficker. And so it makes it hard. And again, I think Ori said earlier, uh, I think we lost Ori, uh, but I think Ori said earlier, um, just mm -hmm. talking about uh, women in different stages of our lives and just different folks, how we go through different things. And you got to imagine what a child that's 13 is going through. Mm -hmm. If she's already had unhealthy relationships early on, um, healthy, um, unhealthy attachment early on, uh, mm -hmm. child abuse early on, she does not know how to have a healthy relationship. Yeah. So oftentimes um, I'll get girls. And so when, we, when people ask, why don't they just leave? They have now bonded with that trafficker, unhealthy or not, um, unhealthy or healthy, they've already bonded. Yeah. And so it makes it hard for them to leave. Um, that's one. I don't like I said, I don't know where Ori went. Um, <laughs> Oftentimes, also, girls find that uh, they don't have a life after being in the life. And, wow. and we can, that is a whole um, another tra training, but there's a lot that is, uh, that it's entailed with uh, girls trying to leave or wanting to leave at a certain point and feeling like um, they just can't leave. Um, him being a kidnapper or him um, holding her, you know, you know, when she does not want to be held anymore. So you have a lot that goes into um, that mm -hmm. question of why don't they just leave? Wow. Or you were gone for I a minute. Did. I don't know if you wanted to time yeah, in I'm too. Not, yeah, I did. Sorry, I lost it. it, it is, <laughs> this, is, this is a new platform for me and I'm a millennial, but I like this platform. <laughs> um, but I think, I think from my experience and what I've learned is that I didn't leave because a lot of times what else did I have to go back to? Okay. Yeah. And when I share that is because I can remember times when I was 14 years old and my trafficker at the very end of my trafficking, I remember complaining about being in a life and I was in the back seat. And I'll never forget the day that he told me to just leave. And the sounds mm -hmm. of the car lock was so loud, so clear. But in my mind at 14 years old, I got out of the car, I ran, and then I started jogging and I started walking. And then I reminded myself, I said, where was I going to go? Who was going to accept me? Mm -hmm. All I'm going to do is be back arrested, go back to a group home. Um, mm -hmm. My mom sure is not going to take me back into the home. The church ain't going to take me. My family don't want nothing to do with me. Wow. Anyway. And these are all what I'm believing. Mm -hmm. And the number one thing was, you know, you question it. Do I get out the car? He might, you know, shoot me in the back of my head. He might drag me. He might beat me up. Is he going to run me over? And when I got to the point where I stopped running was because what else did I have to go to? Like Ms. Wolfolk said, at a time period, there was no such thing as like CSEC, commercial sexual exploitation of children. There was no resources. There was, there was no understanding or empathy. Yeah. Um, and I definitely didn't want to be seen as a criminal. So I think a lot of times we have to think about what does the child have to go back to? And even when kids come from stable homes and they, they are a part of the system and we come in contact with them, as much as I want to say a lot of parents are supportive, sometimes they're shown from the family. You know, they're blamed for the things that they did. Um, and we're not looking at it as a whole. I've met a lot of kids who have great homes, but when they go back home, they're always being reminded of the mistakes that they made. Yeah. You know, and they're being shamed for what they, they've they been through and the things mm -hmm. that they encounter. And sometimes people don't want to take responsibility for the things that they might have had an impact in that child's life. Wow. So then the yeah. relationship is mm -hmm. rocky. You know, going back to what, when you're talking about kids in poverty, when your mom ain't got no, enough money to put food on the table, you know, where you going back to, I can only imagine if I would have been trafficked much early on in my life, 
I remember living with my mother in a one bedroom apartment with six of us. I can't remember every detail, but I remember that. Now I can only imagine a child that's 13, 14 going through that. You're going through you're really trying to figure your life out, and then you have to go home to that, you know, in condensed spaces, and you don't have your own space, and you're trying to find your way. Mm-hmm. I think of another thing um, of why they don't go is because sometimes we don't see the other end of the rope. You know, we can't see what's at the other end of the tunnel. We become so used to, and it becomes our normal. You know, rape becomes normal. Chaos becomes normal. The life becomes normal. Yeah. Everything yeah. that goes along with being trafficked becomes normal. And especially for kids who've been traumatized and who've been molested, that's normal. Especially for yeah. a child that watched their mama get beat their whole life, that's normal. Mm-hmm. Somebody who watched yeah. their mama or their daddy, you know, be abused, that's normal. So anything mm-hmm. outside of that is uncomfortable. I think that my life right now is 25 years old and things that are, that have become, Sarah Jake Roberts said, she said, you know, there are default settings, things that I have to come out of because what's, and Pastor Michael Todd talked about that transformation church, he says, uh, what's not transformed is transferred. So if I don't wow. transform wow. to my highest self that God has created me to be, right, and walking in his way, mm-hmm. that means everything, my demeanor, and I'm telling you this, I'm on a retreat right now, like just by myself in this room, secluded room, like, I have to work on myself for Evelyn's sake because if I don't watch my tone, if I don't watch my demeanor, if I don't watch how I speak to people, it only be carried on Evelyn. And then she treats people that way. And then she carries herself that way. And if I don't develop um, or learn and love myself fully or know that I am enough, then she will grow up not knowing that she's enough. And yeah. it's all those things that are very important that people um, need to understand and why kids go back. It's normal. Yeah. And as bad as it sounds, I'm not crazy. He was like, well, "Why is that normal for somebody to beat you?" And everything? life has always been that way. I was molested as a child. Nobody ever heard me. I was never seen. I was never heard. I was always the black sheep of the family. So now, me being in life and going back home and then being told, "What's that on your neck? Why you got this? Where have you been at? Why yeah. do I not want to go back to that?" Another last right. thing I'll say is, for someone who's been abused by maybe a close family friend, right, or someone that I know being abused by a family member or a stepfather. Abuse is much better, as sick as it sounds, to be done by complete strangers that you don't know from the people that said they were here to love you, protect you, and to be there for you. Mm -hmm. And we have to keep those things in mind. And a lot of times, um, you know, for me, getting out of life was just more so I had to have the support. I had to. Because if I didn't, it would have took me much longer. If I didn't have the people that said they loved and they cared about me. And being with wow. so. wow. and, and I, and I want to say that um, this is what makes Ori uh, a great advocate. I still have kids right now asking for Ori. Um, you know, they they want her to be their advocate, and and Ori has gotten out, and Ori's always had a strong mind. Um, you know, I have some girls that are not as fortunate. And that's why advocate, advocacy is very important, especially for someone that has been in their shoes for the girls that um, find it really, really hard or they're very, very depressed. Um, yeah. It's important that they have an advocate, someone like Ori, who can, um, who's been there and can talk them through it. Um, mm-hmm. But we have girls, I've had girls tell me that um, what they go through as horrible, the things that I've heard that they've gone through out on the streets, you know what they tell me? That it was worse. They've gone through much worse as a child being abused and raped. Wow. And so sometimes they just get used to that. Um, it is better than what they, or he says something earlier about they're always running from something. You know, they run from home or they, they run from a placement or a foster home or whatever it may be. They say that it was much worse there than what they've been in right now. Um, mm-hmm. And I remember, I remember clear as day, I um, was talking to a girl at a group home. And I remember in my head, terming this coin like good pimp, bad pimp. And I remember her talking about it. Of course, she had a history of, of child abuse and um, all these different things, but um, she didn't want to testify against the good trafficker. She really? wanted to testify. And what she, what she saw as good trafficker was meaning that um, he doesn't really beat her up, but this bad trafficker, um, he was somebody that beat her up. He drug her you know, in the car and all these right. different things. And, I, and I, I bring up that to say, sometimes they can be, you can be, at a place where you're down so low that just the smallest things and the smallest gestures of kindness and goodness, they don't even understand that 
what they, it's all bad. And they've gotten so used to being treated badly that even the kindest, uh, I mean, the smallest gesture of kindness, you know, is better than what they're already going through. Well, oh just to chime in, it's like, it's reason why a lot of survivors, and I'll just speak from my experience or people that I know, and even from mm -hmm. my own experience, is why when we get out the life, we get into mm -hmm. unhealthy relationships because it's the thought process of, well, he's not a pimp. He's not a pimp. He's not taking my money. He's not doing yeah. this. So then we go from one relationship to a bad relationship to a domestic violence relationship because he's not a pimp. It's okay if he, he, he do that because he's not a pimp. And it's that same mentality when a child is being trafficked by another trafficker or why they don't leave because, well, it's better than this. It's better than yeah. being home and being talked to. I mean, and I, for one, have seen firsthand parents talk to their children like just that's just in just i just I, I couldn't i couldn't understand it you know and once they're in the situation of they have been trapped why would she want to come home to that right and a lot of it is just from anger i know that it's anger it's hurt it's disappointment what did i do i'm not good enough i wasn't a great mom what did i do wrong i wasn't a good father i i thought i did and it's the mm -hmm. anger blowing up but a lot of mm -hmm. times it's, it's why would they want to come back home to the same old thing you know and i've looked at situations where being an advocate and going to visit some of these kids and I wish I could just take them all with me because it's like and live in this big old house because I'm like why would they want to come back to this even though I understand because I've been in situations where I've had nothing but why would she want to come into a house where it's only a two bedroom you got the room the grandma got the room and they sleep on the floor mm. like why would she and she lived in an apartment with a trafficker even though she going through all that it's all those little things that matter and I yeah. promise people think that it don't happen but it do you know, and it's going on, especially with our kids. So, wow. Sorry, we, I was not uh, hearing. Good conversation. Yeah. No, yeah. no, and, and it's good, and 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 just um, like and like Ori said, there's a variety of reasons. But I've had girls that um, we finally rescued, and you know, and they're maybe age seventeen that have zero credits in high school. Yes. Um, so you know, no high school diploma. And that, again, we're talking about poverty earlier, and we're talking about just different vulnerabilities. Um, mm -hmm. When you have zero credits. It's that that mentality of what is it that I can do? What can I provide? I've already been on the streets. I might as well continue to go. Mm. And so, wow, my goodness, yeah. good conversation. Okay, yeah, yeah great conversation. Yeah. Um, the next question is, what does child sex trafficking look like within our community? Um, and I, and I think we pretty much, uh, I know we've been talking a little while, so I think we kind of covered it, but, um, many of us see girls on different boulevards, half clothed. Um, that's what we see, but, uh, we don't see the girls that are um, being trafficked online. And so just from my experience of the last few years, um, I'll see that, um, or I'll interview girls that are now 16 years old, meaning they finally come to the attention of the system, but at always never fails i'll ask them how long they've been in we call it the life how long they've been in the life they always tell me 12 since 11 or 12 11 yeah. 12 13 so by the time they already they come to our attention they've already been on the streets for two or three years yeah. um you know in all that trauma but um it looks like the internet i think a lot of times uh girls are the younger girls that i've experienced they they were usually trafficked online so they weren't necessarily on Union Boulevard. I hear a lot of girls, um, they come through Bakersfield. Um, they always, I always ask them where they're trafficked at. They tell me, um, Mount. I didn't know about Mount Vernon, but they tell me about Mount Vernon and of course Union Avenue. But um, girls can be trafficked online. So you may not see them out in the community on Union or Mount Vernon or Figueroa or Western now it's out only here. Fans. It's only fans. Yeah, there only all fans. Different there. Sites. Yeah. Right. So they may be setting it up online for a kid to be trafficked and the child is already at the hotel. Mm -hmm. um, so you said back, page. Page. I back page is open again. If what, I'm that? Here, what should I be looking out for? For um you talk about as far as safety goes for your child? No, no. As far as far as um Trafficking. How, what what signs would I see? What would I be able to look oh, okay. out for? And I think that's one of the questions down below. Oh, but, that's um, like timid. Like I mean, you. A lot of people too have to understand that it's not. There's no sign on kids, especially for women or young men who might be mm -hmm. trafficked and being exploited. Mm -hmm. But I think sometimes people get an intuition. Like I'll never forget when I've done these trainings, and a woman came up to me and said, "You know, I was in a grocery store. A young young woman. I knew she was a young girl, like about 16." 
came up to me with all these different fem feminine products or she had so many condoms, like all this different stuff. And something in my spirit told me to say something to her, but I just did it. And I just couldn't say anything to her, you know, and I just kept going, you know, or I think about when I was in that McDonald's at 13 years old and having hardly anything on. And a lot of times we turn a blind eye to something and instead of reporting it or calling law enforcement you yeah. know and i grew up in a family strong about that about you know not telling the people your business you sure for sure but not be telling social services and nobody nothing and i think it's it's reminding um ourselves mm -hmm. that it's okay to say something if mm -hmm. we're teaching our children it's okay to say something it's okay for us to say something yeah and i think especially in certain neighborhoods yeah it might be and, and like miss wilfox said it's a lot much more happening over the internet where they're mm -hmm. going to be in calls out calls where kids are being called out to a hotel or called to you know or someone coming in more so um wherever they're located and i think it just looks a lot different in every community you know if you go to a more predominantly maybe a higher end higher income area trafficking is going to look a lot different than what it would you know down in south central los angeles it's going to look different yeah. on fig and things like that so I think keeping in mind and looking at behaviors of timid behaviors or situations where you see a young girl or you could be, you know, at at a restaurant, you see a young girl and an older man and just something don't fit right. You know, for sure, that ain't their grandpa. They're not adopted. They're not no foster right. youth. This right. don't seem right. You right. know, and even right. if it's just, you know, I would never say to anyone engage or say something to a trafficker in that way because you want to be safe about it. But I think it's really important for people to still report it. You know, when you see something, right. report it. And I've mm -hmm. drove down Fig in Los Angeles plenty of times. And I know when I see young girls. I know it's the way that they yeah. dress. Because when you're first out there, you're not comfortable with your body in that way. You know that they out there. You know what they, what they, how they're dressing, the way yeah. they carry yourself. So. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's good. Thank you. Okay. The next question is, why is trafficking a billion-dollar industry? <laughs> this supply and demand so um yeah it, it's supply and demand it's basically um you know as long as there's a pedophile as long as we have pornography uh there is someone that wants that and so there is a, a huge supply of i mean a huge demand for sex and for kids and selling kids and so um there is a demand for it I think another thing too with it is that people have to think about this. When you're trafficking, when you're trafficking drugs or weapons, right? Yeah. You have to buy the drug, process the drug, sell the drug, re-up on the drug, do it. What a human being, you can do it over and over again and not have that much to do afterwards, you know? And you kind of just kick back and continue to sell a human being over and over again. You know, and I think people need to keep that in mind because why it's a billion dollar industry because it's so easy to for perpetrators and the predators and the people that do those things. Um, Absolutely, it's much more accessible as well over the internet. Mm -hmm. You know, they can get away with saying that they're over eight, the age of eighteen, or if they're on certain sites. So we have to think about that when we're talking about a billion dollar industry because it's much more accessible, it's much more easier. People, it 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 becomes a billion dollar because if I have five girls and I know that they're going to be out there seven to 15 times a night, even though I know that it's being raped and being exploited, but they're out there and they're making money for me as a trafficker. Mm -hmm. and I'm bringing in thousands and thousands of dollars, untaxed dollars. And I don't have to go nowhere and buy a product again. I can just resell them and resell them and resell them again. All yeah. I got to do is make, wow. you know, the, like the things we talked about. So that's really important. Yeah. Okay. And I think that's why you have uh, more and more gangs uh, selling girls and, and trafficking. Because of this, because, you know, when you get busted for some drugs in your car, the evidence is there. When you traffic kids, you know, you got to get arrested. But guess what? That child has to testify against you. Kids don't want to testify against their traffickers. Yeah. They're terrified. They're 13 years old. So sometimes it's a crime that you can get away with. You don't like Ori said, you don't have to re up, you don't have to do these things. And so it is a it is the money maker. Wow. But ladies, this is awesome. We have about 10 minutes. And we're ready for the next question. Oh, uh, you know what? <laughs> it's muted. Unmute, Unmute Glenda. <laughs> okay. Well, 
in light of that, that we only have about 10 more minutes, maybe we have maybe time for one more question or so. Yeah. Um, well, well, we can kind of go over the ones that um, we feel like um, is important. Um, some of the signs, let me just go over the signs that a kid is being trafficked. So yeah. um, if you're a school teacher, if you're in the schools, when you see a lot of truancy at the schools, that is a sign that a kid is being trafficked. If you see new tattoos, um, pimps and traffickers always brand. There's always a branding. They're stable, usually have tattoos, um, but you will always see some type of new tattoo. You'll see tattoos here. You'll see tattoos across the neck, on the chest, but there's different tattoos that you will see. He will brand. Um, a lot of running away from home, running away from foster, uh, foster care. Um, what we see in the court is, um, believe it or not, even, even when trafficking was still, um, not trafficking, I'm sorry, when prostitution was still a charge that was being, um, when kids were still, be, still being criminalized, um, I still rarely saw the prostitution charge. The number one charge that I saw, that I see to this day in the courtroom is petty theft and assault against mom. That is always, when I see assault against mom, that is always a high risk factor and it's a red flag for me. So when I see truancy and all that, but if I see that that kid is coming to juvenile hall or coming to court for an assault against mom, that is always uh, um, a red flag for me to go and talk to that kid. Petty theft. So it's not usually a trafficking, I mean, a, a prostitution related charge. It's usually those type of charges that we'll see. So those are all red flags that, um, that I look for when I'm, when I'm watching for kids. Now, are, there, are there any websites that that you know when you're you're checking for your child um, computer? Are there any signs of different websites that we need to be aware of? Um, websites. I mean, you need to be. You should probably have child locks on your um, on your kid's computer. Your kids. This is this is the thing. Your a lot of kids. You know, I'll go on websites. I mean, I'm sorry. I'll go on kids' Instagram pages. It's wide open to the world. It's not private. And so your kids are online showing themselves and taking selfies um, and displaying them to the world. So they're an easy target. All they have to do is change the profile pic and they're communicating with your child. So you likely have um, someone that looks like a Justin Bieber or, or somebody young and they're actually communicating with a 40 year, 48 year old man. They meet at the McDonald's and then bam, that's how it happens. I know that it seems simple, but it actually happens. It's also- So important. our kids, we need to monitor our kids. Go ahead, Ori. Yeah, and it's important. I, I told someone the other day, you know, raising Evelyn, I think that I'm definitely, Evelyn will be an exception because she'll have a mom that's not, you know, not conforming to what everybody else is doing. And, you know, Evelyn can't have a phone at certain age. I don't care what y'all talking about. An eight, nine-year-old don't need no phone. Who does she have to call? She can call me through the school. I'm picking her up every day. Don't need that. Mm -hmm. that it baffles me and blows my mind at certain things, especially that even with games someone mentioned on the chat, like, you know, my nieces and stuff that I was taught about Roblox and different little games that they can chat with strangers. And it's like certain things that if a child, the age restriction is 12 years old, and I commend one of my survivors sister because she does not play that. Her daughter wanted a uh, TikTok, and she said, you are not 12 or 13 years old. You are not having a TikTok. No, yeah. absolutely not. And I think it's sometimes as parents in this new generation, too, in the new, you know, the world that we're living in today is it's like we're being backed up in a corner because we don't want what well, everybody else is doing it. And I don't want my child to feel absolutely not. And it's sometimes holding our ground and saying, you know, like, no, you can't have that. No, you can't do that. You know, or if they're of age, um, I will be monitoring that. Let me, and I've been taught, and because I've been blessed with so many people in my life, that even too, Evelyn will have a time restriction. Mm -hmm. Nine o'clock hit, boop, countdown, three, two, one, phone, <laughs> shut off. No, you don't yeah. the phone in your room. For what? Who do you have to talk to at two o'clock in the morning? You should be ready to right. get up in the morning. You know, so it's all those things as parents that we have to be firm on. We really have to be firm about that. Yeah. Because I see a lot of shifts happening with parents and just this generation where, you know, I, I yeah. And even though the internet said, well, they're going to do it anyway, but you can still have some control over it, though. You yeah. Can still and, and, and be aware of your, um, and a lot of girls, I mean, they, it's, it's no fault of their own. Um, they go hang out with a friend of a friend. And they get caught up at their friend's friend's uncle's house. Oh, let's just go to his house, caught up. 
So your kids just always need to be aware and you need to remind your kids. I think that sometimes we steer away from not talking to strangers and that simple term. No, really, you don't need to go with people that you don't know. And it's so many different ways kids can get caught up. All of us at any time in our lives, in our young lives could have been um, caught up in these situations. Um, like I said, and just the, the trauma of what our girls go through, um, I did want to talk about testifying and um, the trauma. So we continue to ask like just what the girls have been through. We talked about child abuse and we talked about all these things, but we have not talked about um, the trauma of testifying. And Ori can, um, can, can talk about this too, but um, some of my scariest moments um, was having a girl going to court with the girl who asked me to go. This was early on. Again, this is um, our, our unit was very new. Um, we were just talking about, it was during that time we were starting to talk about and uh, shine light to child trafficking. But um, I still remember going, and I never told anybody this for a long time, but I remember going to court because she asked me and she was testifying. I remember her getting on that, um, on that stand. And mind you, her charge was only um, a prostitution related charge. She didn't assault anybody. She didn't have a big felony, but she had an orange jumpsuit on with um, shackled. This is what our girls go through. And this is what um, the majority is black girls. Um, but she was shackled. And I remember her getting on that witness stand. I'm the only person there, a probation officer. I'm not a mom or anybody else. She had no one in that courtroom with her. And you want to know what was in that courtroom? There was a, the pimp was, um, of course, um, sitting next to his lawyer. But throughout that courtroom was um, his pimp partners. There was a grandmother in there. And there was people scattered around that courtroom eyeballing her. And so she told her story and it just, it has hurt my heart because she told her story about, um, she was 17 at the time. She was 13 years old when her trafficker drove past her middle school, her middle school. And so she's telling her story and um, she's terrified because she didn't want to tell. She had me pray with her before she got up there. And um, the scary part about it is I had to walk out of that courtroom alone as a single woman walk out of that courtroom and those traffickers and those pimps, you know, we going down the elevator together and doing all these things. I say all that to say, if I was scared as an adult, imagine a 14, 15, 16 year old child, yeah. how afraid of their traffickers they are. How, when they get on that stand and they snitch, there's a green light on them after, you know, they um, they leave that courtroom. So when we see these big drug busts, not these drug busts, I'm sorry, when we see these busts on the news and all that, and you know, all these kids were rescued, those kids have to testify against that trafficker. They have to, the accuser, I mean, they have that right to be in the trial and the um, he gets to, you know, cross-examine that accuser. You think these kids are not on that stand and crying and snotting and the tears are running down their eye because they now have to sit across from that trafficker who has um, abused them, who has um, done all kind of horrible violence to them. So that's what we're that's what these girls are dealing with. And so when they leave that, what are we expecting them to do? Sit still in school, go back to the group home that day and, and not act right. So trauma in turn comes out as anger all the time, cussing people out, running away. You'll often see kids running away when they know that they have to, they've been subpoenaed to testify. So um, this testifying in and of itself is just a horrible, hard experience. And it's a scary experience. Yes. Well, um, how can we join the fight and get involved? Um, so I think we have the, Oh, I'm glad you guys posted the, um, the child abuse hotline. So um, again, if you see something, say something. Child abuse, I, we put up the national um, human trafficking hotline. You can always call that when you suspect trafficking. But um, remember that child trafficking is a reportable offense. You can call the child abuse hotline if you suspect. And so just like um, you have, you, we have some uh, mandated reporters in the schools and probation officers. Uh, when you suspect somebody is being trafficked, that is a mandated reportable um, uh, thing. So you can call that that line. Um, so say something, you know, when you see it going on, um, you can refer to your local advocacy agencies because uh, I believe Kern County has advocacy agencies. I know that we use Daughters Project 
as one of our group homes in um, Kern County. Um, but advocacy agencies are always, you always want to connect girls to um, advocacy agencies. Uh, churches, churches can always reach out to kids. Um, we have these sororities and fraternities. We can all um, come together and provide mentorship to girls that have been trafficked. Ori, did you want to add something in there with... Uh, no, I think that just the best thing is if you see something reported and also to the best the best way to stop this is by preventing it. Um, and mm -hmm. definitely, like Ms. Wilfolk said, is having different groups or putting together mentorship programs um, and resources available for youth who start, the, you know, the grooming process doesn't just start also with a trafficker. Mm -hmm. The grooming process starts from the trauma that's being dealt with at home, um, but also to just the things that they experience in life. And it's how do we connect our youth and just relationships are very valuable and they're important because our kids need a safety person. They need safety people that they know if I can't talk to my parent, I have someone else that I can talk to that's safe versus a stranger. So um, the best way to stop it is always to prevent it and catch it early on. And I like what Ori said about relationships. And I think that that is the most important. Um, if you didn't get anything out of tonight, relationship, relationship, relationship. Because at the end of the day, um, if I have a youth and uh, she's always running away, you always want to build a rapport. You always want to sow a seed. Anytime you have a youth that you know is being trafficked, they are going to likely relapse. You want to make sure, and I think what it was important for Ori and I is that even though Ori didn't always do what I wanted her to do, um, when she was not in my custody, she knew that she can call me. That is the most important thing that you can do for a child that has um, that has been trafficked um, is ensure that that relationship is intact, because what we do all the time and I hopefully um, a few of my colleagues are on here and they can um, they can vouch is that we always have, you know, rescue missions for our kids that call from it from Louisiana and say, you know what, I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. And you want that relationship. You want to be that parent or that person or that aunt or that advocate or that teacher that a kid can reach out to when they're in trouble. But that is extremely important. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> uh oh, I can't hear. You're on mute. Okay. That was excellent, ladies. I just want to yeah. know. Last question we have for tonight, Pam. That was, was that the I last? Think, I think I think that was it. Are we are we going to open up for maybe two or three minutes? Or yeah, we're going to open up for some questions. Uh, yes. You got an excellent job. I don't know if you. Yes. you it's not like you covered everything, but just in case somebody had something else to ask, you guys were absolutely fabulous with all the information. Does anyone have any questions you want to ask Ori or Tara? Do we have any questions? Okay, mute them. Okay. Where they are. Okay. Yeah, I don't see it. I think you guys were very thorough. Uh, okay. Yeah, I think you guys are very thorough. So, seeing as we have no questions, five, four, <laughs> five, four, three, two. And somebody just said, excellent. Very, very thorough. Very thorough. Thanks yeah. for having me. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome, awesome, yeah. awesome job. Yeah. Excellent job. I want to thank you for sharing and being so so vivid about um, the life out there. And I I applaud you, Ori, mm -hmm. for having to come through what you've come through. And I know you probably hear that I, I can't even imagine. And then to see you where you are now how far you've come from and where you are now. Mm -hmm. And how you talk about your daughter, what you want for her. And I just think that uh, you're doing great things, but greater things are to come. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. I really, I really do. Greater things are to come with you. And your collab with Terica, you know, I'm, I'm always proud of my children. And I'm proud of Terica. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, she would call me and exchange information about when she first became, when she first, when she first got into that division. You know, she would call and tell me things and uh, we would kind of talk back and forth. But I always said a prayer for her because I, I know the, the, the situation she was going to be in. And, uh, but I've come to see where she is uh, a true advocate for it. Not just a probation officer, but she's an advocate 
for people and for you for you to talk about her like that because she talks about you the same way. I just want you to know that, Ori. And the relationship that you guys have, have gained together is just simply, like you said, Ori, before, that it's a God sin. So I just want to thank both of you for being on here tonight. Terika, I'm so proud yeah. of the information that you know about Oh, uh, thank you. you Very I am, I'm so proud of you. And I'm, I'm glad yeah. you guys came on tonight and shared what you shared. I know I know Ari is on her, her retreat. So she's oh, yeah. she back. She does herself <laughs> here. She's on her retreat. But I want to thank mm -hmm. you so much. And I want to thank our audience tonight. Uh, before I leave, before we leave, um, Pam is going to give us some instructions on more things we got coming up in the future. Thank you again, Tarek and Ori, you guys. Thank you. Just awesome, awesome. Yeah. Thank you for having us. We appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. You got Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's on you, Pam. Can't hear you. Let's see. Let me unmute you. Okay, there you go. Okay. Hey, this, uh, this is our membership month, the month of January. Um, if you have not joined, um, we're trying to um, really do some, some great things here for the community. Uh, so I urge you to join. Uh, visit us at no sister left behind the number two dot org uh, and join. But if you have decided that maybe it's not the right time for you personally to join, Please donate. We are a nonprofit. Everything goes into our program. Mm -hmm. And as Ms. Glenda will tell you, so I'll tell you first, <laughs> we do not have to be a member in order <laughs> to participate or receive the information uh, mm -hmm. uh, from our organization. Uh, you are still a part of the community. We want you involved. But membership helps us to put those program, programs out in the community. Mm -hmm. So please. Mm -hmm. I'm a member, it's $50 uh, for, for a year. You get discounts on branded products, uh, discounts on ticket items uh, hosted by NS, NSLB, early registration, physical, mm -hmm. digital membership cards. But more than that, much more than that, it's helping the community. It's yeah. helping us. So we urge you tonight to join the fight for us. Our calendar. Next Saturday at 8.30 a.m., <laughs> we will be at Riverwalk with uh, Bakersfield uh, Girl Trek. So, sis, we're coming out there. We're going to join you. I don't know how far I'm going to be able to walk. <laughs> we'll be out there, okay? Um, and so that's at 8.30 at Riverwalk mm -hmm. on Stockdale Highway. And then on February 13th, we have Dr. Beatty. Yeah, that's amazing. On Tuesday, that gives us um, wellness checks. And mm -hmm. so we're going to have a wealth of information for us. Again, yeah. that's February 13th, Dr. Beatty. And then February 20th, we have uh, Stephanie Smith. And she is going to be talking to us about grief. Um, Glenda, she's a counselor, correct? Yeah, she is. She's, uh, Stephanie is, uh, um, she has an MSW, uh, licensed clinical so, uh, social worker. And she does counseling and therapy and, uh, she worked for a hospital center, but now she has her own business, her own, uh, her business. And so she does grief counseling and she's yes. very good at it. So we're going to have her on talking about grief. Yeah. So let's tune in for that. Um, we've all experienced that, um, in our lives. Yeah. And so again, thank you. Thank you, um, Ms. Wolfolk. Thank you, Ms. Ori. I, I really appreciate you guys. You were a wealth of information. The audience, I've, I've been looking and, and they really enjoyed the talk. Yeah. Well, ladies, this is the end for us. It's 7.31, we were a minute over, but I thank you for holding on again. I apologize for not clicking live at the beginning, but <laughs> I, I appreciate you for coming in and embracing No Sister Left Behind as an organization. Uh, and look forward to more things in the future from us. Thank you so much and have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>